last Sunday before the worship service here, I received something. Somebody gave me something uh, last Sunday, right before the worship service. And it made me feel so good when I received it that last Sunday, my sermon just went on. And on. <laughs> it made me remind about giving the pastor gifts right before the service starts. But anyway, for what I, I have it here, the, what I received last Sunday, and, and some of you will probably recognize it. Some of you recognize this and what this is. You have no idea. You've never seen it before in your life. Okay. This actually is a thank you card. It's a thank you card. And I don't know if most of you saw it or not. It says, Dear Jesus, thank you. And on the inside, it says, Dear Pastor Steve, thank you for ministering here. We love your sermons and are learning great lessons from them. And God loves you, and so do we. Kennedy, Jacob, Cindy, and Kate. You made the hot right? I love that. This is my old place. And that made me feel so good because you all were thanking me uh, for being here. And it's very important that we say thank you. And whoever is teaching you to do thank you cards is doing you a great service. Because we need to learn to say thank you a lot more often than we typically do. You don't always have to make a card, but a card is real nice. That's very nice to say thank you to someone who's done something special or has done something for you and that you really appreciate and you say thank you for it. Why do you think it's important to say thank you? Why do we need to say thank you to people? What do you think? You know, what, what did I just say? How did, what did, how did it make me feel when I got this thing? What did I just say? It made me feel really good. It made me feel really good. It made me feel appreciated. And when people are doing things for us, um, you know, we want to let them know that we appreciate what it is that they're doing for us. And so it's very important that we say thank you to those people that are doing things for us, especially doing special things for us. So can you think of anybody that maybe you should say thank you to today? Has anyone done anything special for you today? Like maybe fix your breakfast this morning or drive you here to church and get you here today. Maybe someone bought these nice clothes for you that you're wearing here this morning. Can you thank anybody that maybe you should say thank you to? Maybe your parents, maybe mom and dad, maybe your grandparents. My grandparents, yeah. Your grandparents, Think hard enough, you can think of some special things that they do for you on a very regular basis. And we need to let people know that we appreciate them. And one of the special ways we do that is by saying thank you. So we need to remember to do that. You know, there, there's, there's another uh, very special person or being, perhaps, that we need to say thank you to on a regular basis, too. And I think it's one of the reasons that we come to church. Who else can you think of that we need to say thank you to? on a very regular basis. God. That's right. God. You know, God blesses us with so many things as well. And we need to let God know that we appreciate that, that we're thankful for all the things that, that God does for us and all the things that God provides for us. So, if we need to thank God, how do you thank God? Do you make a thank you card for God? You could. That's right, you could. But we don't usually think of making a thank you card to God because how do you deliver it to God? You know, how, how, how do you get it to God? Mm, maybe. You find one. But what, can you think of other ways besides a thank you card that we might thank God? With prayer. Yeah, that's a very good way. In the morning when you get up, you can say a little prayer and say thank you God for this day or in the evening before you go to bed. You can say a prayer and say thank you to God. And you know, another, besides, besides Jeff's prayers, which are very important, and we do need to do that every day, another way that we can thank God for all the things that God provides for us is by trying to do the things and be the person that God would like for us to be. Being the nicest person that you can be, doing things for other people, and sharing of your love with other people. Those are all things that God wants us to do. So one of the ways that we can thank God 
is trying to be that very special person that God wants and wishes that each of us will be. So that's a way we can thank God as well. So we keep that in mind. So let's thank God this morning with a prayer. And it's going to be a little different prayer this morning, something I sometimes like to do with young people and sometimes even with older people. So we're going to ask you to participate in this as well. I'm going to do a repeating prayer. You guys ever done a repeating prayer? Where I will say a few words and I'll pause and you guys repeat what I say so that we're both saying the prayer. And I need you guys to repeat it as well. Okay? So shall we pray? Dear God, yeah. we thank you today. We thank you today. For all the good things in our lives. For all the good things in our lives. We thank you for the birds and the flowers. We thank you for the birds and the flowers. We thank you for our family. We thank you for our family. We thank you for this church. We thank you for this church. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for loving us. Two interesting scripture readings that we heard this morning. The one that I want to focus on is the more familiar one. I remember last week I told you a little bit about familiar scriptures, um, so we need to pay close attention to this one again today. But the scripture reading that I want to focus on this morning uh, is the one about the two sisters, Mary and Martha, who were very likely. Um, according to the way I read the scripture anyway, I think they were very likely some of Jesus' closest friends. And that was the focus of this scripture reading, the second one that we heard today. Now my focus this summer has also been on two sisters, my two daughters, Emily and Mary Kay. As you know, my oldest daughter, Emily, was married two weeks ago in a beautiful ceremony uh, in St. Louis. And my youngest daughter, Mary Kate, is getting married this coming Saturday. And what I hope will be a likewise beautiful service at the Lake of the Ozarks outside. Now my two daughters, you don't know them, my oldest daughter Emily actually came to church here one Sunday on Father's Day. So some of you did get to see her. And if you remember, she's about five foot eight inches tall, blonde hair, blue eyed. Well, my youngest daughter, Mary Kate, is also about five foot eight inches tall, blonde hair, blue eyed. Uh, of course, I think both of them are beautiful young ladies. Uh, both sisters graduated from the University of Missouri in Columbia with degrees in music education. They are both music teachers in public schools. They both have wonderful singing voices and have been singing in church ever since they were three or four years old, uh, much to my delight. Both play the piano exceptionally well. Both were chosen as the drum major for their marching band in high school. And of course, they are both being married only three weeks apart. <laughs> Some might think that my two daughters are almost identical but they are not. <laughs> they have completely different personalities. They have completely different senses of humor. And they have completely different ways of looking at the world. <coughs> My oldest daughter, Emily, is a perfectionist. She's an extrovert. She never met a stranger. Uh, she loves being around people. My youngest daughter, Mary Kate, is quite the opposite. She's an introvert. She's quiet. She's reflective. She likes to think things out before she takes action at all. They are completely different in so many ways. They were raised by the same parents, in the same town, with the same brother, just as Mary and Martha with Lazarus around were. But they are completely different and unique people. These two sisters, my daughters, Emily and Mary Kay, have occupied my thoughts and most of my actions for this summer. But in a remarkable sense, as I read this passage again, 
about Mary and Martha when we're introduced to them for the first time uh, here in Scripture, I was reminded of my own daughters. Two sisters that have a lot of common but are still very unique. Shall we pray? Our Lord and our God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts and minds be acceptable in thy sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. According to Scripture, Mary and Martha live with their brother Lazarus in the village of Bethany, just outside the city of Jerusalem near the Mount of Olives. You may remember that it was Lazarus that Jesus raised from the dead. In telling the story of the raising of Lazarus, John in his gospel says that Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus saying, Lord, behold, he for whom you have great affection is sick. Obviously, Jesus had a special place in his heart for Lazarus. John goes on to say, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Looking more closely at the Gospels, we find that Jesus and his disciples often stayed in the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus when they came to Jerusalem. This seemed to be a place where Jesus was comfortable, where he could hang out with his friends and relax before he sojourned in right next door into the city of Jerusalem and had to face society and the criticisms that he faced when he often went into Jerusalem. So I believe that Mary and Martha played a very special role in the life of Jesus. And what's interesting to, the, to me about them is that even though they were sisters, they were so different from each other. Just like my own daughters, Emily and Mary Kate. Yet, from every indication, Jesus loved them both. And that's sort of my point in this message this morning. That God's love is more inclusive than we can ever imagine. And no matter how different or out of sync you may think yourself to be, or more likely we think our neighbor to be, God still loves us with a great love. And there's a place in God's family for you and for your neighbor. As Jesus told his disciples in Matthew, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast wide into the sea and gathered some fish of every kind. Or as Charles Wesley, the great hymnologist, wrote, Thy sovereign grace to all extends, immense and unconfined. From age to age it never ends. It reaches all mankind. As we listen to the way Mary and Martha are described in the Bible, I'd like for you to think this morning about all the different Marys and Marthas you have known in your lifetime over the years, who perhaps, like you, fall somewhere in between and rejoice in the fact that each of them and each of us are precious in God's sight. So, what do we know about Mary and Martha? They first appear in the Gospels in this passage from Luke's, Luke's Gospel that we heard this morning. And it began, it happened as they went on their way. He entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. As I just said, Jesus and his disciples often stay in this house further on as we continue to read in the, Bible, in, in the Gospels when they came to Jerusalem. Yet in this passage, this very first passage, Luke is clear to say that Martha received him into her house. Now what does that tell us about Martha? Well, I think it tells us that first of all, Martha was the oldest of the three. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. I also take it to mean that she was the one that was in charge of that particular household. You might be interested to know, as I did some research on names, as I've done a lot of since I've been in seminary, that the name Martha actually translates into Lady of the House. 
And many of the names that are used in the Bible have a meaning to them. Martha means lady of the house. And as for Mary, Luke simply tells us in this passage that Martha had a sister called Mary who sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. From the outset, the picture we get of these two women is that the older sister who was quick to assume responsibility and needed to know and needed and knew, knew what needed to be done, and then the younger sister who was comfortable deferring to the authority perhaps of her sister and letting others carry the load. Martha was pragmatic and concerned about the details of the meal and having everything just right there in her house. Mary seemed somewhat idealistic and had her head in clouds. Martha was a doer. She liked to stay busy. She expressed herself by doing things for others. Mary, on the other hand, was content simply to be. She was thoughtful, contemplative. She expressed herself by her willingness to sit and really listen and give that other person her full attention. Well, as we see in this story, this caused a little bit of a friction between the two sisters. According to Luke, once again, but Martha was distracted with much serving. And she came up to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister left me alone to serve? Ask her, therefore, to help me. Have you ever heard of a Meyer Briggs personality in the story? Unless you're in education, you might not hear too much about that. It, it's an instrument that counselors use to get a handle on identifying personality traits of people. In my former life, I spent a few years as a high school counselor, and I used the Myers-Briggs personality inventory a lot. It's an interesting little thing. It's quick. You can do it very quickly, and it gives you a lot of clues about an individual. It indicates, for example, that some of us are extroverts. We draw our strength from outside of ourselves. We love being around people. At the same time, it might indicate that you're an introvert, that you're more into drawing your strength from within yourself, and you don't have to have a large body of people around you. If you're interested in yourself, here's a little test you might do that's not the Myers-Briggs, but when there's a crisis in your life, do you pick up the phone immediately and call your family and your friends and talk to them about it? Or do you go off somewhere by yourself and try to think about it, work things out? When things go awry, an extrovert tends to go into high gear and contact everybody you can. Um, the introvert tends to back off and think about it and contemplate it a little bit. There's a story that's told of uh, two guys that were talking about their marriages. They were good friends, and they were talking about conflict in their marriage. We all have some conflicts that come up, even in marriages, even in the best of marriages. And one of these guys said to the other man, uh, when my wife and I have a fight, she always comes crawling to me on her knees. <laughs> Now, the other guy knew this guy pretty well. He couldn't believe that statement. He's shaking his head and he scratches his head. He said, now, wait a minute. I'm not sure about that. The first guy said, no, it's true. Whenever we have a big argument, I go hide under the bed. My wife gets down on her knees and crawls over there and says, come out from under that bed and fight like a man. <laughs> Introverts, extroverts. <laughs> Another personality trait uh, is this. Some of us rely on concrete reality. We're facts and figures people. We have to know the specifics, the facts, what's going on. While others of us are more intuitive, innovative, and we feel comfortable writing our own script. Uh, we're the ones that are like, more apt to say, don't confuse me with the facts. My mind's already made up. Uh, some of us are predominantly thinking types intellectual, systematic, and analytical. While some of us are feeling types, we're empathetic and emotional. Some of us prefer to things, get things resolved and bring things to a close as quickly as we can. While others of us like to keep things open-ended, fluid, subject to change. The point is, God created us 
uniquely and individually. And God gives us a variety of ways to live out our lives. The challenge is to celebrate our differences and recognize the fact that we don't all think alike. We don't all act alike. We're all unique. Mary and Martha were as different as night and day. Yet, they both loved Jesus with all their heart. And he loved them in return. We see this played out once we get to the story of the raising of Lazarus. According to John's Gospel, Lazarus became seriously ill. So, of course, Mary and Martha both sent for Jesus, their friend, who was a healer, who hopefully could take care of their sick brother, Lazarus. As it happened, Jesus and his disciples were camping, camping on the Jordan River north of Jericho, which was over two days' journey from Jerusalem, where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived. Mary and Martha sent word for him to come at once, but they didn't leave until the next day, and then it took two more days for them to travel there. By the time they got there, Lazarus was dead. John says in this passage, Then when Mary heard that Jesus was coming, she went out and met him. But when Mary Martha heard Jesus was coming, she went out and met him, but Mary stayed in the house. Again, we see the difference in their personalities. Martha was impulsive, and she was quick. She wanted to go out and act. So she went out to meet Jesus. Mary is more pensive. She's waiting for Jesus to come to their home. As John tells the story, Therefore Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Can't you just hear the anger in the tone of Martha's voice? If only you'd been here. As if to say, what took you so long? It's all your fault. You should have been here sooner. If the tables had been turned and it had been Jesus who sent for Martha, you'd better believe she'd gotten there right away. She wouldn't have waited around for a day or two before she left. She would have been there right away. And when she got there, she'd take, take charge, do something, make it right. So she seemed to be demanding that of Jesus. After Martha spoke to Jesus in that way, he sent for Mary. Mary got to Jesus. She fell at his feet. And she says almost exactly the same words. Lord, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Yet coming from Mary, we hear the same words in a completely different tone. Not so much anger as sadness and resignation. This is seen from the fact that Mary begins to cry. And when Jesus saw her crying, he was so touched by her grief that he began to cry with her. This is where we get the shortest verse in the Bible. Two words, John 1, 35. Jesus wept. He wept over the death of his friend Lazarus, but maybe even more importantly, he wept in sympathy for his friend Mary, who was obviously suffering terribly. When he regained his composure, Jesus ordered the stone sealing Lazarus' tomb to be rolled back, and he prayed to God. He called with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And to the amazement of all, Lazarus came out of the tomb, bandaged from head to toe, and Jesus said, free him, and let him go. When you read the Gospels, you realize that was Jesus' last recorded miracle in the Gospels. And his first miracle was when he was at a wedding ceremony, reminding me of my daughter's once again, in Cana of Galilee, and the miracle there was prompted by his mother, Mary. Sort of fitting, perhaps, and maybe even ironic, that his last miracle and his first miracle were both prompted by a woman named Mary. And in this case, by Mary and her tears. It so moved Jesus that he unleashed his divine power to bring her brother back to life. Mary had a special gift of quiet love and devotion. 
that obviously brought out the best in Jesus and probably brought out the best in others as well. As for Martha, she had special gifts as well. And perhaps her greatest gift, as described in the Gospels, is the gift of hospitality that sets others at ease. In this text this morning, Luke said, Martha received him into her house. On another occasion, we're told that Jesus came to Bethany. They made him a supper there. Martha served. Hospitality. Hospitality is one of the oldest and most time-honored of all gifts. Did you know that in the early days, hospitals were actually wayside inns <coughs> in which travelers could find food and lodging and refreshment from their journey? I talked about that last week in the, in the story of the Good Samaritan. They were called hospitals because their primary purpose was to provide hospitality. This whole business of treating wounds arose out of the necessity as guests came into the hospital bruised and scarred by the rigors of their travels. So that whole terminology, hospitals, develops out of providing hospitality to others. The hospice movement, inspired by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in Great Britain, started off and continues this day as an effort to recapture the spirit of hospitality by giving the terminally ill a comfortable and caring place in which to live out their final days. Hospice. Hospitality. Mary had the gift of hospitality. She opened her home to Jesus. She nurtured him with food from her kitchen. She gave him a place to get away from the pressing crowds and to escape the hostility of religious leaders and society of his day. Hospitality is a wonderful gift. And when offered in the name of Jesus Christ, it's every bit as important as the ability to sing, or the ability to play an instrument, or the ability to teach a Sunday school class, or the ability to get up and preach a sermon. Hospitality is truly the staple of Christian discipleship. Okay, this is an old joke, so don't stop me if you've heard it, okay? Three women who were friends were on their way to a prayer meeting. Unfortunately, there was a terrible accident, and they were all killed. So they went up and they reached the pearly gates together. And one by one, they stood before St. Peter. So St. Peter asked the first woman, were you a Christian on earth? And she said, oh yes, I was a Roman Catholic. Here, here are my rosary beads. St. Peter looked at her beads, how worn they were, how much she obviously had used them and prayed with them. And he said, oh my, welcome to God's heavenly king. St. Peter looked at the next woman and he said, were you a Christian on earth? And she said, oh yes, I was a Southern Baptist. Here's my Bible. And he took the Bible and he saw how dog eared the pages were and how much it had been used and cried over and prayed over. And, and St. Peter said to her, Quite welcome to God's heavenly kingdom. St. Peter looked at the third woman and he said, Were you a Christian on earth? And she said, Oh, yes, I was a Presbyterian. Here's my casserole dish. <laughs> Inside the meals that we share with those who are in need, those who are sick, those who are in grief, the visits that we make to the homebound, to the elderly, the extra effort that you put into welcoming visitors and helping them become part of our family of faith, the effort we put into the website, that they can look at that and say, oh, this is a place that seems welcoming to me. All of those are as pleasing to God and as important to the mission of Christ's kingdom on earth as anything anyone else could possibly do or say. Hospitality is a precious commodity and it should be a staple of Christian discipleship. Martha, she was hospitality. She welcomed Jesus into her home. She served him from her kitchen. 
And by contrast, we have Mary, who sat at his feet and held on to his every word. According to John's Gospel, she was the woman who later on is going to anoint Jesus with costly ointment and wipe his feet with her hair. Two very different, very different sisters. But Jesus, Jesus loved them both equally. And I'd like us all to recognize today that while Mary and Martha were, were as different perhaps as night and day, Jesus made a very special place for each of them in his heart. I like to think that as different as all of us are, God makes a special place for each one of us in his heart as well. And he's calling each of us to share the good news of his love with others. I like the way that John Ernest Vogue put it in this prayer, which has become him. It says, O oh Jesus, Thou hast promised to all who follow Thee that where Thou art in glory, there shall Thy servant be. And Jesus, I <coughs> promise to serve Thee to the end. O oh, give me grace to follow my Master. And my friend. My daughters, Emily and Mary Kay, are quite different. But God loves them both and has a special place in God's heart for them. Mary and Martha were quite different. But God loved them both. We all are quite different. And yet, God, God loves each of us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Shall we pray? Oh Lord God, each of us is you. We are all your children, brothers and sisters in Christ. But like Mary and Martha, we are all different. Our God, help us to celebrate our differences, realizing that you need each of us, regardless of our personalities or abilities, to be a part of of establishing your kingdom on this earth. Give us the patience to accept all others, to be able to recognize their value and their worth, for we are all equally loved by you. Thank you, Holy God. Amen. Would you please rise now, either in your body or in spirit, as we sing our hymn of response number 591, Have thy own word.
as we join together in our affirmation of faith, which is the Apostles' Creed printed in your bulletin this morning. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and stood on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to Jesus to the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As we now prepare to give of our tithes and offerings in this book, we need to keep in mind that we all have our differences, but we are all one family. We all come to gather together in this place on Sunday morning to worship God. And one of the ways that we can thank God and that we can truly worship God is by being generous with all the blessings that God has bestowed upon us. In that spirit of generosity, let us now hear the Lord Thomas and Robert.
We ask now that you use these gifts that we return to allow all others to share in your love so that they too may know that they don't walk alone. It is in your holy name we pray. Amen. May you see it. Let's enter into a time of prayer, shall we pray? Our God, as we celebrate the love you show to each of us this morning, we also recognize that there are many who are not here with us this day. For those who are sick or infirm or bedridden, we ask your hand to be upon them that they might also feel your power and know your love. For those who are traveling or for some reason are far away from here, give them comfort, give them safe travels, and give them peace of mind. And for those who are merely absent for no particular reason, we ask that you stir their hearts this day and gently remind them of the great gifts and blessings available to them in fellowship with other peoples of God. And for us, gathered here in this place this morning, we claim those blessings of Christian fellowship and affirm them by repeating the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven,
Thank you for watching Channel 7 and 98. Hi, thank you very much for watching Channel 7 and 98.